inch mm. to be young questioners. Mm. And one of them was in tears afterwards. So what is it that will resource um, people mm. in that situation? On both sides, I think. Mm. But heaven knows how you um, resource uh, council bureaucrats, and I'll say more about that when I get to my bit. But mm. Mm. Also, I think there are huge needs there, and what, it, what could happen could be very apathy-inducing, um, both for young youth strikers and for bureaucrats. They say they just don't understand we've got our... Thanks, Joe. I could just talk on your, the subject of creating a safe space and this fabulous news about uh, the youth and that the judges um, have, have chucked out the government's appeal. I just want to say I actually listened to the whole thing on live stream, that whole, um, with, with the defendant's lawyers talking <coughs> to the three judges on the panel. And uh, it was, to, I'm being very subjective about it, it's my impression of it, but it, to me it was creating safe space because there was one man and two women judges and the man who seemed to be the leader um, he he was very hard hitting and sceptical and we're not listening to any previous judgments and it started out I thought this is a disaster okay and there were two uh, defendant lawyers um, the second one was a young she looked young woman and she got up there and he started sort of serving her curved balls really and so did the other two this is I'm being very subjective about this but she just stood there. <coughs> And she took her time, and she reflected back, and she engaged them, and she, and gradually, it was like a safe space was created. Mm -hmm. And you could actually see them starting to see the magnitude of the problem. And it was all done through case law and this and that. But it was almost like then it started to be, how can you help us make this case? You know, and it was a human exchange. It was the most remarkable thing. I really, it's like an hour and a half. I really recommend anyone to look at it. Anyway, that's my take, but it really was the creation of a safe space, mm -hmm. and I think it was quite profound what happened in that conversation. Mm -hmm. so John, which case was that? Mm -hmm. um, it's the, the young people, Giuliano, um, uh, the young people in America are taking the US government to court for breaking the Constitution mm -hmm. and not protecting their future. Mm -hmm. John? Um, <clears throat> yeah. I'm really struck by the several lesson, uh, references to, to, to safety in a safe space. I completely get it, but I have a different take, which is something we need some unsafety. Mm -hmm. um, uh, I'm, that, I'm, I'm sort of psychological group psychotherapist, and I sort of say, well, I say to my supervisor, I'm just, just attending to safety, and my supervisor sometimes says, well, why? <laughs> um, and um, I, I, I only have a little bit of supervision from him because I think <laughs> I do want to say this thing. I also know that there's a problem with that, um, and I do wonder in what ways we're over attending to safety in this yes. gathering in the Guild mm -hmm. of Psychotherapists and this overwhelmingly white gathering in the Guild of Psychotherapists and, and how we could get some unsafety going. So I completely hear that. The idea of the, we're steeped in ideas about containment and, and, and holding and, and safety, but um, I, I also just want to sort of. Shape I, I want to. Some I want to come back complex. because I really disagree with you. Do, I yes. think that um, we're not talking about something fuzzy or soft. We're talking about the very conditions for being able to think, and uh, and that's profound. And you do need to have some sort of that. That's what I mean by safety: the conditions in which it's a, you're able to think. So if we're going to think about the most profoundly uh, unsafe state of our world, we need to create conditions in which it's possible to think about that. That's, that's, that, that, that's <coughs> what I mean by it. It's just a, a small um, difference in the language I think is very important. I prefer to talk about safe enough spaces mm -hmm. because yeah. a safe space well, like in the whole thing in university, trying to create a safe space, mm -hmm. um, seems to be shutting down the risk level, where it's mm. safe enough means it's tolerable, we, we can work with it, we can think. It's still risky, but yeah. it feels all right to, to think and, and say things that other people might disagree with. Yeah. Hi, um, my name is Omei, and I'm, I'm a doctor, I'm interested in climate psychology. Um, 
And I'm sort of interested in what you were sort of mentioning about safety. And I think there's a lot of people who would want to have some kind of safe space to discuss these things, but it's difficult for them to sort of find a sort of contained space for their distress. Um, and I was wondering if having some <coughs> kind of um, anonymized support line um, for people sort of experiencing the specifics of climate uh, distress might be useful as some kind of stepping stone for them, making it more sort of comfortable for them to talk about it in a group space. <coughs> maybe having something similar to um, a Samaritan um, support line for people worried about the um, crisis and sort of making that sort of association between the sort of psychological distress that people are facing and then sort of signposting them on, on these good things that they could do. I just want to practice in mm. some kind of safe space. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> Jill, would you like to? Uh, this is Jill Westcott. Hello. My work was to talk with. Um, council officers and council members in the South West. Um, this research is quite old now, 2011 to 2013. Um, but I think perhaps in the context of climate emergency motions, it may be quite interesting in, those, in what attitudes within councils will this encounter and how will that relate to any action that follows. So I think <coughs> Although I encountered a great many uh, of what one might call defensive responses, and in fact 25% of the sample of um, 34 would qualify as climate deniers or skeptics, agnostic about human causation or whatever, which is quite a, a formidable proportion. Um, it was much more common to, for me to encounter what you might call implicatory denial or stealth denial in Rosen's words or disavowal, which is to say, yes, it's human caused, yes, it's happening, yes, it's terrible, but it's not our first priority. So um, an example of that kind of um, statement might be what one leader of council said to me. He said, um, sadly, 99 times out of 100, apart from arts and culture, it's usually anything to do with environment, climate change. It's at the bottom of the pile. If you're a single mother feeding your family of three young children, your most important thing <coughs> is that you clothe, feed, keep a home for that family, far more important than working on sunshine or snow. Um, and in fact, he goes on to talk about if you talk to most of the holiday makers who come down here, and it went from 23 to 27, they'd be delighted. So that was a kind of um, middle of the road, fairly typical, but rather colourfully expressed um, example of what I found. That's not to say that um, the local authorities weren't active in carbon reduction in response to the then government's um, work, incentives, uh, policies under the Climate Change Act of 2009. So um, all of the councils in which I had interviews had um, reduced their carbon emissions. And I think in all of them by somewhat more than would be accounted for by their reduction in activity anyway as a result of budget cuts. Um, but few of them had done work which affected their general area rather than their own estate yeah. and few of them had gone above what would actually save them money. Uh, so I'll talk more a bit about the business case which was a crucial concept. So in these uh, attitudes, I think I could well discern what Kerry Marie Norgard calls the cultural toolkit of how one defends against people who say well, you should do more action. And that included the kind of, well, it's not a priority for various reasons. It included a degree of flippancy. Um, well, it might not happen for 3,000 years, and by then we might be living on Mars, someone said to me. Um, but then drew back and said, 
But then, of course, if we do wait, it might be too late. So I also wondered about what is going on when I heard several different um, approaches or apparent beliefs put to me by the same person in the same interview, as if there's a kind of shifting rationale which is employed to uh, keep criticism at bay, um, or perhaps to keep emotions at bay, and that is certainly something we've talked about and which I recognise very much. So, for example, uh, one energy manager tells me um, that he doubts the findings of climate science, and <coughs> everybody always says things are black and white, but they never are. He says scientists change their mind all the time. Later in the same interview, he's saying, there's no point in the West saving carbon emissions if China and India are increasing by a bigger amount. What's the point? So this is a rationale which says we can't make much difference anyway. And I have to say that was also a very common theme. People are aware they don't have many financial resources, although it may be employed here in a defensive mode. There, there is also a, a factual element to that in that local authorities have now lost probably more than half their budget since 2009. It's hard to do statutory things, let alone discretionary things. So I was struck by the comparison with the literature on bystanding. And the larger the number of bystanders, the less likely any of them are to intervene. Literature on the attitudes to um, Jewish people in Nazi-occupied Europe. The people who were rescuers were those who felt more personally effective, often had strong moral um, views which made them say, well, anybody would have done the same. They didn't regard themselves as, effect as um, unusual. Whereas the bystanders would tend to say things like, I felt helpless, what could I do among so many? So there is a, uh, an analogy there. And then thirdly, this energy manager explains that in any case, there's no point in him putting major expenditure bids to the council because they will veto them unless there's a strong business case. Mm -hmm. So again, we come to the, the I think it's a, a unifying discourse is finance. Mm -hmm. And rather than proposing something which might be regarded as idealistic or fluffy, something which is expressed in financial terms, not only uh, meets the situation of intense financial pressure, but it also meets the thing of an acceptable discourse. Um, I'd like to quote one more um, counsellor, a very experienced woman, and in the interviews after talking about climate change, I um, invited counsellors to say how they viewed the future. So I invite this. How do you feel about the future? I don't know whether you have grandchildren. Councillor says, I have six, two in New Zealand and four in Gloucestershire. I say, so it's a, a worldwide family. Councillor, no, of course I do. One thinks of their, and then she hesitates and breaks off. But I tend to be realistic. How realistic is it? I don't know. You can only go with your common sense. I hope I've got some common sense. What are your views on nuclear then? <laughs> Change of subject. So what is happening here? She thinks about her grandchildren's future. She breaks off and switches tack. So what would happen there? Is it an anxiety-inducing thought? Is it a thought of, what can I do about this? In another um, episode in the same interview, she switches dramatically to talk about homelessness, where she has done quite a lot and feels that she is effective. So it seems that this is too emotion-laden to think about. And also there's this um, counterposition of being realistic mm -hmm. to how she perhaps perceives me. And then she diverts to the nuclear question to um, move the subject to something where this counterposition might play out in a more advantageous way. I encountered this um, opposition, really. I'll give you a couple of quotes about um, the way people expressed their um, view. And to be fair, in this case, as well as others, I'm sure there are some issues about green, fine, 
But actually, in the real world, you know, <laughs> or um, another councillor, I'm not green like some people who sit in the council because I'm also practical. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't say I'm terribly green. What I'm trying to say is that I view it as more common sense than trying to see all sides to it. And so those champions within councils, perhaps officers, uh, experience this othering um, where they are told they're not practical, they're not realistic. But what those terms, I mean, Paul, you've talked about this, that actually those terms, being practical, being realistic, the implication is non-action. So it's as if they are um, abandoning hope of change. And uh, even Caroline Lucas, at one of the first Extinction Rebellion events, I, I gather, said, I hope you can do something, because when I talk about climate change in Parliament, I get laughed at. So I think this is not just about councils, it's about in our individual social environments and also in the most, um, you know, the national decision-making structures. So those were the obstacles that I encountered. Um, oh, another issue would be that institutions as well as individuals can do splitting. Send it to environmental health, a low um, status department without any money. But it's interesting what was not denied. So all the time these interviews are going on and people are presenting these rationales. Flood defence works are going ahead. Vast millions are spent on them. Um, a coastal town which is in danger of um, destruction from storm urges is lobbying Great Western Railway with great intensity to guarantee the future of the railway which prevents their town from being flooded. So there is no climate denial in Dawlish. <laughs> and what I infer from this is that there is what the positive psychology people would call rationality. It means self-interest. There is a logic to what people deny and don't deny. And I think that whether it is a political interest, as Naomi Klein has identified, or as I found in some of the areas that were suitable for wind turbine applications, and you find climate denial tropes being um, mustered and reported verbatim from uh, some of those campaigns, their interest is in using this information to oppose applications, or whether it's because people genuinely feel that there is nothing they can do, but the denial is kind of pain relief, really. There is a logic to what gets denied and what doesn't. So, in conclusion, I think that um, when many of us are familiar with the fact that information alone won't generate action, but also help with the psychological um, aspect, the defence against facing difficult truths, while vital, doesn't in itself enable action, unless there's a sense of agency. And David Ballard suggests that for even an increase in awareness, there needs to be agency and there needs to be association. Maybe it's the, the safe space where it's possible to encounter one's feelings about these things, but also the awareness that other people are also acting, other people are also experiencing it in this way. There was an interesting example of one high status uh, council officer in an authority quite large and urban that did take significant um, steps, not only to um, reduce carbon in its own estate, but also to do wider measures. And she, over a period of time, raised the, uh, legitimised the discourse about climate change. So they had a showing of the inconvenient truth with popcorn, everybody was invited. She identified courses and workshops on which councillors were sent. And um, when they had a time capsule underneath a new development, she placed items in it, talking about climate change and with some emotion. So she allowed more a, a creation of a sense of community. And I think that is one of the things that enables action to take place around the issue of climate change within that authority. She wasn't the only champion, but she was a very effective one. So I think 
What is what would make a difference to local authorities? Finance. It short circuits the difficulties. It allows a discourse on, on financial terms in the short term without trespassing. But it also would have to be uh, part of a mandatory scheme so that the association, all, all councils would have to respond. There was quite a big difference in, among the councils I spoke to and some would act in a thoughtful way, others would do as little as they could get away with. So, um, and to short circuit the tragedy of the commons, one needs a mandatory scheme and also the international dimension has to be comprehended. I found that councillors and officers were not only extremely ignorant about the science, the time scales, the um, level of climate change, the impacts, but also about measures that might be taken in other countries to combat climate change. Um, China is trotted out, but without any awareness of the speed of development of renewable energy in China. I'm not trying to reassure myself that this is sufficient, but I think that that um, issue of agency also requires a lot of communication on an international as well as a national level. So I'll finish there. Thank you. Any um, thoughts or questions to Jill? Yeah. Yeah, um, thanks for that. It was really interesting. I was struck by what you were saying about what is not denied. Um, uh, sort of, I, I, um, I live in Calderdale in um, West Yorkshire where we've experienced both some massive floods and also some uh, a lot of fires on the moors nearby. So because it's very yeah. close to our on our doorsteps, Cordell Council has the claim mm. climate emergency. And um, you know, having that that has quite a big impact on the sort of whole, the way it's talked about. Um, but the other thing I was really struck about is I think this kind of idea of the Overton window of acceptable discourse mm -hmm. uh, within within with any area and that that finance is a, unif a sort of u acceptable metric mm -hmm. of, of, about which to speak mm -hmm. um, about climate change. And I, actually, we were just talking um, in that first little chat we were having at the, right at the beginning about some, uh, something that was on the BBC yesterday, which was um, a response, I think it was a response to Philip Hammond saying it was going to cost a trillion dollars yeah. too. Um, they had two people, one person, um, Talking about how it's much too expensive, and you know we need to sacrifice a real, real, quite, real. You know it's going to be. The other person that they interviewed was almost more annoying, even though he was kind of accepting the fact that it was a valid investment to make, because they were both using models, financial models that were utterly meaningless. Given that the question, the BBC, the phrase, the BBC were actually using was, "Is it worth investing in this stuff to avert?" Catastrophic climate change. You know the clues in the phrase. You know, it was going to be a catastrophe. Actually, the economic model we're forecasting to 2050 perhaps won't work. You know, <laughs> and that perhaps the costs of not doing it are going to be a bit more than oh, maybe it'll be one eighth of our you know GDP, which will mean that we'll get to our rate of kind of quality standard of living a little bit later, but maybe only six months later. You know, like suddenly you go. This is the most meaningless, absurd, kind of like Kafka-esque kind of um, um, discourse to be hearing on the radio. And yet somehow it's the acceptable metric about, yes. about which, <coughs> how we talk about it. How is that? And, you know, so, so I was just kind of reminded of that, and that idea of finance was the mm. acceptable metric, particularly within local authorities. Yeah. Uh, thanks. I'm, I'm Paul Bottenham. I've, I've worked in local government, and I, I think the um, I, th I, I think that case study is really interesting about what it says about time and how uh, how pe the, the bounded horizon, time horizons that people are working to, and how we introduce uh, the dimension of um, accountability to the future. Because you know, in local government now, there just isn't time to think, um, let alone uh, to think beyond the next election. Uh, and, and I think there's something very interesting. I would, I, I'm new to all of this, and one of the things I'm trying to explore, partly because I'm now working with, with faith-based organisations, which have a very interesting perspective Sorry, on time. Photo organisations. Faith faith. Yes. Faith. Um, so, in a sense, there, there's a there's a stance that's outside time, 
how, what kind of um, tricks and methodologies are there that enable us to situate ourselves um, across time boundaries? And, and, and one of the things to explore, of course, is, um, I mean, some government, government time in, in institutions have established like ombudsman for the future, that kind of thing. Um, I think the kind of ombudsman for the future role, even within, um, you know, a, 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 I don't know, a, a, a grief circle or a, uh, whatever spaces we might want to create, would be a, quite a useful way of exploring this. But I, 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 I would want to, to delve a bit further into the, the, into the interpretation of time that's going on in the heads and the, the decision making of the people that, that you encounter and how, what we can do about that. If I could just reply to that, um, the thing about time is not only embodied in people's heads in the way that you describe, mm -hmm. but it's embodied in the rate of interest at which they are expected to receive a payback for investment. Mm -hmm. And even in the two years that yeah. I was doing the thing, it shortened from about 25 years to two to seven mm -hmm. years mm -hmm. that they expected a yeah. payback. Now that's money measured as well. Mm -hmm. And we all know how mm -hmm. um, misleading that is. So. I think the um, issue about the long term is really recognised to some degree within local authorities, although they don't feel able to do anything about it. And I was really struck when I meant, asked that question about the future, that of those interviewees who answered it, the ones who felt that the young people would be inheriting a good future, I think there was three, and these, and did they mention these? this sense or these feelings or these considerations in their council? Of course not. It doesn't permit that. Yeah. But something but there's a huge burden of grief because they mention so many factors. Not just climate change but the decline of public services and so on and so on. So there's a burden of grief there which is not has no outlet. Mm -hmm. okay. um, I'm struck by the two things that have been talking about. You were talking about the council and that feeling of resources, and they talk about finance. Are we not picking up a screaming sense of lack of resources, which is also came into this thing about safety? When you were talking about the lady, the council lady who did something, she was prepared to go into her own unsafe space to provide safety for other people to be able to have the conversations. And I wonder whether sometimes the safety that we keep talking about is our own, rather than being prepared to stand on the edge and therefore provide the safety that these things can happen, and also be aware that the people around us are actually feeling resource less. And so how do we resource them so they can hear and it's not the financial resources they're worried about, it's also the personal resources. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think that's very helpful and it also ties into the um, I don't know if people have come across this, but the um, ideas about emergency mode mm -hmm. and normal mode, so that we help other people to go into a more emergency mode by going into it ourselves and acknowledging emotionally and practically, and then we start behaving differently. Because people always look around and say, how, how are other people, if they're going about their ordinary business, it can't be an emergency. Mm -hmm. But if they see that other people are acting on it, so. But thank you for that. That really uh, helpful insight. Okay, we're going to have to uh, wind up in a few minutes, and um, I just want to say a few things, Judith. Uh, after you finish, okay. you have one minute. Yeah, um, just a, a few <coughs> things to to sum up, and then one of the things that emerge from all of the chapters quite spontaneously really, was the idea of um, business as usual as a kind of unifying threat, mm -hmm. yeah, operating at a number of distinct levels. So at the highest level, the meta level, business as usual is, is one of the key phrases of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and most of their main scenarios for the future are based on the business as usual model and they've got at the present moment five different pathways built around this notion of the business as usual model that if we pursue their estimates are that we will be heading for between three and five degree 
uh, glo temperature, global temperature increase by the end of the century. Yeah? All of which are absolutely catastrophic. Yeah? This is business as usual at that me meta level. But I think at that meta level, the other aspect of that business as usual scenario is that phrase, that increasingly common now that people use, you know, it's easier to imagine the end of the world than it is to imagine the end of capitalism. <laughs> <laughs> that is also about the way in which the business as usual discourse operates at that kind of meta level. What's also interesting in the book is several of the chapters, um, the Dean Andrews chapter, Rosie Robinson's chapter, your chapter, focus on life in organisations, in institutions, which are dominated by business as usual uh, rhetoric, and how difficult it then is to be uh, an ordinary paid professional or officer in those organisations um, where that rhetoric is so powerful it defines, as you're saying Jill, what can be talked about and what can't be so talked about. Yeah. Um, and how, um, if you start talking about the unspeakable, how quickly you then get written off yeah, yeah. as being some kind of shameful, unrealistic uh, kind of individual. Um, and I always remember, and I put it in the kind of conclusion to the book, years ago when the whole uh, business model was coming into higher education, the professor in my department saying to a young female lecturer who was complaining about the changed ethos, he said, welcome to the real world. <laughs> and that, that's how it operates at that organisational level, that middle level. But finally, business as usual is what we all incorporate into the way in which we adjust in our everyday lives. Yeah, we continue on, business as usual. Um, struggling with that constantly, but always returning to it in a certain sort of way as we necessarily at times return back into a state of disavowal, which is not too disturbing, you know, enabling us to get on with our lives. And I think, as, as Evelyn was just, was just saying there, in a way, we, we've got to become practice in being able to move in and out from safety to unsafety. Yeah? Safety to be able to live our ordinary lives and get on with our ordinary lives, staying with the trouble, but out of safety and into unsafety in order to actually do something about all this. So those themes were just constantly coming up in the different chapters to the book. Um, final plug then, do get your orders in. You can get a discount before the end of June if you, the details are on that um, a piece of paper there. And uh, who knows, maybe it will be the start of a number of books. And it's interesting that I mean, the, as we're beginning to work more and more with the whole issue of the impact of this in our Through the Door initiative, that Chris and uh, Caroline and Rowan and others are, are developing, maybe we are slowly beginning to accumulate a lot more experience as therapists working in this area, which may become the basis of subsequent publications in the future, who knows. Anyway, thank you. Um, and I don't know whether there's going to be any announcements before we break for lunch. Judith, yes? So, um, 